Wapner front and center this hour. The run in rates, the fallout for stocks, the 10-year hovering near 5%, and just as mega cap earnings loom large. The investment committee debating what to do from here. Joining me for the hour today, Shannon Sakosha, Josh Brown, Steve Weiss, and Capital Wealth Planning CIO Kevin Simpson. Good to have you with us here. Let's check the markets. You see we're, uh, we're off the lows of the day. Uh, we're still red across the board. We are going for the fourth straight down day for the S&P 500. Ten year is at 490, so we're dropping a little bit below uh, 5%. Josh Brown, our regional banks are weak. Real estate's weak uh, for obvious reasons. If rates are rising, you would figure that the pressure points are going to be there. But a day after the Fed chair, what are you feeling today? I think the, the big thing is rates and you know, really talking about anything else is, is really like an afterthought at this point. This is what markets are keying off. I want to give you some data here. We looked at the SPY and the Barclays aggregate. We're using AGG, the ETF. Um, they're currently correlated at 0.4, which is extraordinarily high. It's been rising for the last rolling 90 days. And just to give you some sense of historically how high that is, uh, if you think about the, 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 the last 30 years, that correlation has actually been negative 0.31, meaning not, not correlated at all. Uh, what that means is that the bad days for the stock market are the days in which rates are rising, and then when those days reverse, typically you'll see a bounce in stocks. Not happening yet today. Uh, you have a little bit of a bond rally underway, but stocks are still weak. Uh, but I think that if you look, if you if you want to know what's the market going to do today, just pull up the the futures on the five uh, five to seven year or the seven to ten year, and that'll pretty much give you the script of how yeah. things are going to go. We are just being togged around by that rate situation. I don't see it changing anytime soon, um, and and of course there's good reason. You're at eight percent mortgage rates. The housing market is frozen solid. We are seeing the lowest transaction volume levels since the great financial crisis. The average rate for a 24-month personal loan from a bank, 12%, highest level since 07. Now you have 43 million people with student loans who, as of this month, have to start making payments. Morgan Stanley did a survey of 2,000 of those people. 34% told Morgan Stanley they can't make any payment at all. That's the bad news. The good news and this is really important, retail sales, employment, these things are still going strong. So it's a, it's a really tough push and pull we all have to just live with on a day-to-day -day basis right now. Yeah, you know, we, we've had so many conversations about whether there's gonna be a year-end rally or not. And I know that's on all of your minds. Um, it's on everybody's mind, right? I gotta bring in Joe Terranova. Uh, now, he's not, you know, a regular on the show today, uh, but he's made a big move and it, it, it plays right into that story. Joe, you told us you sold the cues, uh, which I'm just so surprised to hear from you because you must have turned bearish on the, on the overall market then between now and the end of the year, because this was the way you were expressing what you have told our viewers for the last few weeks was a way to be bullish into the end of the year. Explain. No, I, would, I wouldn't say that I've turned bullish on the remainder bearish. of the year. I bearish. Think, I think, bearish. Uh, bearish, rather. Yeah, bearish. It's, Scott, it's one of those days. Um, so I wouldn't say that I, I've turned bearish on the remainder of the year. Um, I, I still believe that if, in fact, we're going to see a fourth quarter rally, it's going to come from technology and communication services. Those are the only sectors that are up so far quarter to date. Um, but let, let's kind of go back and, and walk through how I, I played out the expectation that this would be a strong quarter. Um, I was selling out of IBB, Datadog, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley. Then I turned around and I bought the QQQ. So that's basically, that was a good move. I was in the QQQ at around 368. But here's where I ran into a problem. I ran into a problem where I tried to defend that position. And I tried to defend the position at a critical point in the market where, as Josh was initially describing, we've got this, what I believe is now a new dynamic from the Federal Reserve, where it seems as though they don't want to quit. So from the perspective of trying to defend the position, I was in the futures market today. I played the futures market from the long side. So you know, you know how that worked out. It didn't work out pretty well. Um, you have to neutralize positions when they're going bad. 
That's exactly what I had to do at this point, and I lost the right. I lost the right to maintain a position heading into uh, earnings next week, where I think the earnings could be good. But the bottom line is you're beholden to what your P&L is, and the P&L was absolutely going the wrong way on this trade, and I had to neutralize it. But I, I get you. But I mean, gosh, the risk of selling it now ahead of earnings that you still expect to be good. And I just wonder mm -hmm. if, you know, there's a little bit, not necessarily just from you, but overall a, a misread of sorts of Powell. It's not like he was overly hawkish. He just wasn't as explicitly dovish as some had portrayed the prior speakers leading into Powell uh, were. I mean, uh, he didn't go as far as to say, know, just, well, the bond market's done all the work for us, so we don't have to do anything. We can just sit tight. I mean, th that was pretty much what the other speakers have said. I don't know, man. This seems like a big risk to sell so, it ahead of the numbers. So in response to your remarks on Powell, I don't think Chairman Powell did anything yesterday to push back against uh, what literally is open skies ahead for those that want to be the short short the treasury market you want to be short the treasury market you go right ahead because there doesn't seem any marginal demand uh coming for treasuries at all and chairman powell didn't suggest in the slightest bit that that could be coming from the federal reserve or the treasury so you could maintain the short the treasuries the treasuries look like they're pushing towards five percent and it falls back upon risk management. I understand, look, the reality is this is probably the bottom. The fact that I liquidated, the fact that I traded the futures from the, the long side today and I was wrong, this is probably the bottom and I'll be happy for everyone, including myself, because we're all benefit from it. But as I said, unfortunately, when you lose a significant amount of money, you mm -hmm. lose the right to not, you lose the right to maintain a position according to what your particular bias might be I and i'm sitting back right now i'm sitting back i'm sitting back i'm expecting this will be a strong quarter like most people but i'm not positioned for it right now that's for yeah. sure risk management first everything else second i i hear you on that and uh, by the way i know you're busy you're trading today and and it was uh, a struggle to get you away from the machine and i can appreciate that but thank you for coming on <laughs> And spending no, I'm, some gl time I'm, with us. I'm glad to get away. I'm glad <laughs> yeah. to get away from the machine. The machine wasn't my friend today. All right, you hang in there. Uh, we'll see you on the other side of the weekend. Have a good one. Uh, that's Joe Ternova, of course. So let's just kick this around. Um, that's what this comes down to, this game, risk management. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what your view on the market is, you, you have to manage your, your risk accordingly. Now, Michael Hartnett, Bank of America, says that, and he's been, he's been pretty negative on the market, right? Contrarian buy signal triggered for risk assets, what he says, um, that as long as yields stay below uh, 5%, right, absence a surge, uh, absent a surge in yields, oil below 100, that, you know, three-month returns post the buy signal that they get, stocks would be up 5.5%, global stocks 7.6%. What, what's your take here post pal It's not like the market's falling out of bed all that much. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it's not done, but if you're a trader, how crazy do you have to be? You know, how ignorant of risk management do you have to be to go into this weekend long with what's happening in the Middle East? And it's not just isolating to Gaza and to Israel. It's that we've now seen missiles from Yemen, which are coming allegedly because of, uh, of Iranian-backed Iranian militants. So the, so the downside to investing, we've heard some of the most experienced investors who have a more of a global look mm -hmm. and more of a wide-ranging look with between credit and equities, gold, et cetera, like Paul Tudor Jones and like others saying this is the worst time to invest in the market because, and I'm paraphrasing, because of the risk profile. So the way I look at it is, sure, there may be a seasonal fourth quarter rally, but from what level? I would tell you not from this level. Hey, hang on two seconds. Let me go down to Emily Wilkins in mm -hmm. D.C. Uh, following the vote as Republicans try and elect the Speaker of the House. Emily, what's the uh, latest here? 
Hey, Scott. Well, Republicans and really the entire House has just finished their third vote for Speaker. And again, Jim Jordan has fallen short of the 217 needed to get the gavel. And this time he's lost more support than ever before. 25 Republicans decided to vote for someone else other than Jordan. That is three more than we saw the last time. And all of those three, they are members from really critical districts for Republicans to win. Republicans could potentially forfeit the majority if any of those members were to lose in 2024. And of course, this begs the question, where do Republicans go from here? We are hearing reports that they're going to huddle again, that they're going to try and hash out a way forward. But they spent almost four hours behind closed doors yesterday, and they don't seem to be any closer to getting to a solution. Those who have opposed Jordan say they will continue to oppose him. And those who support Jordan say that he should continue to be the nominee. And certainly Jordan made it very clear this morning that he was going to continue to fight. Uh, He suggested he could do it throughout the weekend. But at this point, it's not clear when next votes would be. It's not clear if we're staying over the weekend. And it's certainly not clear what is going to happen when President President Biden's $100 billion package for Israel and Ukraine and other priorities gets to the House. Because at this point, the House is completely gridlocked. They're not able to move anything. We've got a potential shutdown looming in less than a month. And there is just a lot of uncertainty up here in Capitol Hill. Really appreciate it very much. You stay uh, with us. Uh, anytime you have a development, we will, we'll see you again soon. Emily Wilkins down in D.C. So you were saying, I mean, there's two sides to this coin. Right. Um, you suggest it's you know, dangerous to be long over the weekend given the, the Middle East. Um, one would suggest perhaps, too, that it's dangerous to be short going into next week with mega cap tech, much much of it yeah. reporting. And that could be the quote unquote savior that the market needs at a time of you know more volatility, it could be, but but I look at it this way. So what's the risk? So I am long those. I'm all, long all of them except Apple. So I'm long Microsoft. I'm long Amazon. I'm long uh, Meta. Aren't you short I, the Qs though? I am short the Qs. So and that's I mean, my hedge. And I'm sitting with you know at this point because my short in the Qs. I'm I'm less than fifty percent net long. Yeah. And I've not. But but here's how I look at this. Number one, and I'll come to that in a second. Go to what Josh was saying. Interest rates are the focal point, but not the only focal point. That's some of my base case for actually being. Well, Oh, big focal point. Right, it is. But it's not what he talks about are consumer loans. And that's correct, right? And we're seeing some sort of uh, degradation of, con- of consumer credit, but also the cost of capital. Goldman came out today and said cost of capital is 9.5%. The weighted average cost of capital, which is what every buyer, every institutional investor, and by I mean investor, I mean CEOs, companies, the hurdle rate you need to get over to make an investment in CapEx in another company, in M&A, is over 9.5%. For 2022, where mm-hmm. we saw none of that activity, relatively speaking, it was 8.5%. So we've gone up substantially. So number one, it's freezing corporate behavior. You heard Bostic, he talked about the massive tidal wave of refunding that has to happen from commercial credit. Well, why do you think, why, why do you think for example, you know, we, we showed the right. the KRE and the KBE today are, right. are getting hit especially hard. Regional banks, yep. real estate, for some of the very reasons that you're talking exactly. about. The, threading the needle for Powell to me you know, boils down to this fact. It's choking demand to some respects because he says the whole problem with with everything going on right now, there's too much demand. Right. So they're trying to choke off demand, but at the same time worried about they they can't afford to have a credit event. And it was well, I mean, there already was one of some respects when it comes to SVB. I mean, they can't have more bank issues. They can't have more substantial a credit event that causes even Why more not? consternation to them, Look, for the, them. The, the, the issue with SVB, it was blown way out of proportion in terms of its relevance to the financial system. We're not gonna have a credit event in the financial system. We may have it isolated because commercial real estate's on the balance well, well, sheets we of the regional though. banks. Well, we would have though, because it was a, a, SVB was but a small snowball, which started to roll downhill, which became a giant That's snowball we'll because disagree. it spread to the, what That's, do you mean it's disagreed? There's, That's where we disagree. Well, what about, what happened to First Republic? Where's that? First Republic was in the same trade as VB. But I'm just saying, like, if the Fed didn't Who step else in, if the Fed trade? didn't step in, you think everything would have just I been, think, been I, just fine? I don't think it would have been a major credit event. Absolutely not. We're going to have to disagree on that. If it, if it were J.P. Morgan, if it were B of A, if it were Key Corp, that would have been a major credit event. But it wasn't. It was isolated to the VC community, to early startups. You have to look at what these banks actually did for a living and the risk they took on. There was no risk management there. Steve, the flight of deposits from many different banks 
was a, a real potential issue. No, think of what happened there for the critical banks in this country. The ones that the Fed said are critical banks. What happened to them? They benefited. The number of deposits they picked up, the sheer size of the deposits. The big banks de- right. benefited. Well, the critical the, banks of the financial system. Well, we have more regional banks than any other country on earth. You the, can't afford to have the regional banks fail just because the, the well, you're, systemically you're important that, ones are fine. You're assuming that they're all failing. It's not. There was a panic moment there. The Fed came out and did something. They didn't, they didn't inject massive of liquidity on an ongoing basis into the economy. They didn't backtrack from their tightening. So no, so the headlines were great or sensational, but I'm telling you, it was not systemic risk to the credit system, and that was borne out in terms of what happened. Let's get to, uh, speaking of the Fed, Steve Leisman now has some breaking headlines. Uh, who's speaking now, Steve? The Reverend Master, the Cleveland Fed President, is sticking to her hawkish guns, but maybe showing a little give. Let me go through what she says, and you can figure out what it all means at the end of it. She says she supports the average Fed forecast calling for another rate increase and holding rates sufficiently restricted for some time. She says inflation risks are tilted to the upside. And she goes on to say we are likely at or near a holding point at the funds rate. So to the extent she thinks rates ought to rise, doesn't think they ought to rise a lot. She says it's appropriate to keep the funds rate at that peak for some time. A little bit more give here later on. She says whether the Fed needs to hike will depend on all kinds of things like the outlook. She mentions risks on both sides, tightening too much, tightening too little. Says policymakers need to be nimble here. The rise in the 10 years, she says, was larger than she she expected. And if it's sustained, this rise could help moderate demand. Ostensibly, that's that idea of doing the the Fed's work for it. Events in the Middle East, she says, are still unfolding and adding to uncertainty that's out there. On the outlook, Bester will say... Consumer business and business spending are both expected to moderate. Growth is expected to slow below trend next year, especially. That's an important part of her outlook. Labor market conditions, a little bit contradictory here. She says, paint a picture of moderation and resilient. Wage pressures are easing by some measures. And finally, it will be appropriate. This is interesting, but don't take it too dovishly. She says it will probably be appropriate to reduce the funds rate when inflation is still somewhat above our goal. But the Fed will have to communicate. That doesn't mean it's it's abandoning its 2% target. So one of the more hawks on the committee, Scott, saying, you know what? We're very close, but she still thinks on balance one more, but not sort of hell bent on it is the best way I would put it. So you, you've had, you know, roughly, I don't know, 23 or so hours to think about what Mr. Powell had to say yesterday. And I guess my takeaway, as I expressed at the top of the show, Steve, was that I didn't think it's like he was all that hawkish. It's just he didn't meet the doves, if you will, who certainly have sounded more dovish in the days leading up to Powell before the economic club. He wasn't as explicit as some of the others maybe have been regarding the movement in the bond market doing some of the work for um, the Fed. How would you express it today? I don't have much difference with that, Scott. I think that... There's not much to be gained from debating whether the Fed does that other quarter or not. Uh, You can see the probabilities went way down. I haven't looked uh, in the wake of Mester here if they're down further or pretty much the same. Um, The debate is really about how long the Fed will hold. And that's going to be at least six months. Even Rafael Bostic this morning talked about not thinking about cuts until sometime the second half of next year. That's really the debate. That's where the market is right now. Maybe there were people out there thinking that Powell was going to be much more explicitly dovish. But I don't see how you go into a meeting where the uh, inflation rate was uh, up on the month in September. The data has been so strong and expect the Fed chair to be dovish. I just can't really help myself if people came to those kind of conclusions. That was not what he said. That's not what he can say, Scott. It's kind of silly to think that he's going to get to, oh, all clear. Inflation is 3.7%, 336,000 jobs, GDP at 5.4%. What do you want the Fed chair to say in that context when he's trying to bring inflation down? Yeah, I appreciate it, Steve. Thank you. It's good insight. Steve Leisman, our senior economics correspondent. Uh, All right, Shannon, the, the ball gets thrown your way. So how are you feeling about the market on this Friday? Well, I think it's a, a positive, actually, that we're done with Fed speak for this week. And I think that the challenge here is, Scott, is that the more that we're focusing on what the Fed is doing or not doing, if, if I do actually think that investors are sort of hanging on this 
uh, confirmation that the Fed is done. And, and I, I agree with Steve that it doesn't really matter, but I think investors are still looking for that, at least in the equity markets, to create that ceiling for the, for the 10 year right now. Um, I think that putting Fed speak behind us and putting what's happening on the yield side behind us is really, you know, why we should be looking forward to the earnings season. And I think that if we go back to the first two quarters, yes, we have seen earnings expectations come down a little bit for the next three quarters or so, particularly on um, some of the financial earnings that we've received. However, um, we, you know, every, every indication is, is that we've seen an earnings trough in Q2. So, you know, there, there needs to be, I think, some follow through in terms of this earnings season to reset perhaps the, the you know, potential panic mode that um, the rate environment is setting for us. But I think that with Fed behind us um, and really a blockbuster week next week in terms of the data that we're going to be able to gather at the company level, you know, hopefully that steadies um, provided that the results are are better than expected, which they they have been the last couple of quarters. So uh, so I'm, you know, as an investor, I think I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to getting that micro rather than be focused solely on the macro, because the macro right now is very convoluted um, and difficult to evaluate. Yeah, those are really good points, right? You get Kevin, and by the way, Ke Kevin has a number of moves that we're going to get to on the other side of our first break. But before we do that, um, Shannon makes a, a good point. The bulls need something to take their attention away from the 10-year and from the Middle East headlines. And here we go with mega cap earnings. M Microsoft and Alphabet Tuesday, Meta Wednesday, Amazon Thursday. Is that just what the doctor ordered? I think from a news cycle, it certainly is, but we can't discount the interest rates. When Josh talked about the beginning of the show, how important it is, it's the narrative of the market. Because so many viewers, you, you haven't seen interest rates high. Even the expectation yesterday is, well, rates went up, we need them to come down again, because that's what has happened lately. Steve talks about six months being higher. I think we're talking about a year at least where we're going to have rates higher. And that's probably what higher for longer means. And James Gorman in the Morgan Stanley conference call, he kind of nailed it. He said, you know, when you get 5% risk free, it's very difficult to get motivated into the risk on assets. And I think my job as, a, as an equity manager, not an asset allocator, is to look for things, and we'll talk about trades, but trying to find things that can produce relative return in a higher interest rate environment and not banking on lower rates to save us. So let's do this. Let, let's squeeze in a break. Um, I appreciate you being patient um, with us. It took us a while to, to get to you, <coughs> but we're going to start with you on the other side of the break because, as I said, Kevin's got several moves that all of you need to know about. We'll do it next. It's, our chart of the day is in that mix as well. We're back right after this. All right, you saw the Dow there still trending off the lows, and I mentioned Kevin Simpson has a number of things to discuss. We wanted to discuss our chart of the day, which is SLB, the former Slumber's Day. The stock is off the lows. It's still down two and a third percent. We bring it up with oil near $90 because you suggest it's a buying opportunity. Yeah, absolutely, Scott. This is a company that missed on revenues. It beat on earnings per share. But if you dig a little deeper, the earnings were excellent. The revenues were up double digits. They've continued to do that quarter after quarter. The stock's trading a little bit off of its highs, but this sell-off is certainly an opportunity. It's committed to a dividend, close to 2%, but they've been increasing it by leaps and bounds over the past three years. So you're talking about a company that almost benefits from, from the exploration of, of oil, more so than the price of oil. And we're not digging, we're not exploring, so they're putting new rigs up and they're gonna make a lot of money, and it's a stock that on any pullback I would be a buyer of. Get to your other moves in a moment, but. Josh, if I'm, I think uh, you, you owned this not that long ago, right? Didn't, didn't you have SLB? Like five years ago. That long? <laughs> I thought it was more recent. Scott, oh, yeah, more recent. Scott you and I have been together a long time. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. Cut his mic. Be but, back but, to you in a second. Can I just ask a question? You know, you got to start trading near time in a market that's tenuous at best, at very best. Why do you consider this an opportunity with the stock barely off its high? Yeah, because I like stocks that go higher. Oh, so you're playing momentum. <laughs> well, I think this energy space is something that we've been really a beneficiary, a beneficiary for a long time. Is that good so, enough answer for you? So I, <laughs> no. He's speechless. No, you left no. his speechless. I own, I own, Very I few speech. have been he able to do what you did. He I own, me I own Chevron. I own SLB. I own ConocoPhillips. We got a surprise treat in the account the other day. ConocoPhillips paid a special dividend. We're expecting those same things from Schlumberger. I, I really think that it's a company that does have the ability to make higher highs. All right. Let's, go, let's move along. Uh, you bought Caterpillar. Uh, a couple days ago. 
I haven't had a Caterpillar in a number of years, and I, I'm a believer that we're not going to go into a major recession. Regardless of all the macro talk, I think that this is a company that has incredible opportunities. They, they crushed it last quarter, top line, bottom line. They, they beat every which way but Sunday. And we were looking for a pullback to own it. And now for the first time, I have Deer and Caterpillar in the portfolio. Mm. Now, I don't know that Caterpillar is not um, finished going down. I think there can be volatility here. But it's a position that we're going to own for the long term. We initiated it and we'll continue to buy it on weakness. And uh, you write calls against everything? We don't write calls against everything. We, uh, we, we, we write calls very tactically. I did have a covered call on Schlumberger before earnings that we wrote last week. So it helped hedge the position a I little bit today. Okay, uh, so you've been buying Coca-Cola for the last several <coughs> weeks and you're, you're buying more of that too. Yeah, I think it was oversold. There was a lot of talk with many of the stocks that have to do with uh, sugar, fast food, anything that's bad for you, that thinking that with the obesity completely cured, we'll never, um, we'll never drink another soda pop. And, and I took that as an advantage to go ahead and add to it. Pepsi had great earnings. We're expecting something similar out of Coca-Cola. You know, I, I think we discussed a little bit of Lockheed Martin on Closing Bell. I think it was when you had started reducing the position. Now you sold the last little bit you had earlier in the week. And here we are talking about risks and, you know, geopolitics and war and, and all the like. And then you're selling uh, the rest of Lockheed. Why? This price action was horrible. And if, if, if they do increase uh, domestically, if they increase spending on defense, it's something that takes a long time to reflect in the bottom line of Lockheed Martin. We were wrong on that trade. It went down and we got stopped out of it. JP Morgan. So the banks, as we mentioned, you know, after the initial post earnings pop that many of these banks saw, they haven't been trading all that well. So JP Morgan, you rolled the call option out and down post earnings. Yeah, so this was a lot of fun heading into earnings. And we may do this with some of the tech stocks next week. We wrote a covered call thinking there was going to be anticipation of volatility. That's the great thing about the option markets. It'll tell you what volatility might be. It just won't tell you the direction the stock goes. So we wrote a call. We captured about a 90 cent profit in one day. We wrote another covered call. and. As you mentioned, the stock's trended down, so we were able to close that out. It's just taking advantage of volatility surrounding an earnings season. And anyone can do it. You can supplement dividend income with cash flow from covered call writing. It's a great way to, especially in a flat market, uh -huh. to help the portfolio hedge it a little bit. Oh, I love it. Uh, thanks for sharing the trades with us uh, and all of our viewers, too. Let's get the headlines now with Bertha Coombs. Hi, Bertha. Hey, Scott. The Israeli military said today it thinks most of the hostages taken by Hamas are still alive. An estimated 200 people were kidnapped on October 7th. The military said more than 20 of the hostages are children and 10 to 20 are over the age of 60. An army statement said a majority of the hostages are alive, but added that dead bodies were also taken into the Gaza Strip. A new U.S. report says that China's military power is growing faster than expected, with the country's nuclear weapons arsenal exceeding previous projections. The report warned that China may also be pursuing a new intercontinental missile system that could strike targets in the continental U.S., Hawaii, and Alaska. That report comes just one month before President Biden is set to meet with Chinese, his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping. And the Army is accusing U.S. soldier Travis King of multiple crimes after he fled to North Korea. Documents obtained by NBC show that the charges include deserting, assaulting fellow soldiers, and soliciting child pornography. King ran across the border between North Korea and South Korea in July. He was expelled by North Korea late last month and taken into U.S. custody. Scott, back over to you. All right, Bertha, thank you. Bertha Coombs coming up. Our calls of the day. Analysts staying bullish on two big names. We'll find out what the committee thinks about that next. This is a company that's had nothing but positive improvements fundamentally every quarter this year. I think the stock just goes down with the market. It's still a beta name, but it really should not be low 40s. I think it's mispriced and going higher. Why should you like it? I do. I, I agree. It trades with the market, whereas CEO, since he came in, has just had such amazing impact. It's almost unprecedented. Everything he's done has been right, and he's done it with incredible execution. All right, McDonald's, Kevin Simpson, price target goes from 340 to 310. It's still a buy at UBS. Uh, you own that too, right? Yeah, I think the call might be a little late. When it got down to 250, we brought it back up to a 5% position. I've owned it for 10 years. It's an incredible dividend grower. If it gets up into that 290s, we'll write calls on it. And if his target's right at 310, we'll be super happy. Josh, what do you think about 
about McDonald's. I mean, Shake Shack's the way you primarily play. Uh, I think it may be the only restaurant stock you currently have. And correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, so I'm not a big fan of individually owning a lot of these types of uh, restaurant stocks. Instead, I own Toast. I think if you own Toast, you benefit from just this bigger trend of people eating out more, whether it's casual, high-end, quick service. Uh, I still like TOST. It's been stuck in the high teens for a while. Um, but I think that's the way to go because in any given quarter, any of these restaurant companies can screw up or have an execution issue or miss the mark with their advertising. And I don't want to be susceptible to that. So TOST over pretty much any individual name. Shan, how do you, how do you view any of these in, in this space? Yeah, I think it's it's the big question, Scott, is what happens to middle income consumers, right? Do you start to see trade down into, um, you know, from a Chili's or an Applebee's to McDonald's? Um, I think that if I look at, you know, being able to drive sales without price promotion, so if there's loyalty programs or an app, McDonald's has been executing well on that. Um, or to Josh's point about a, a Shake Shack, you know, is there, a, is there a specific demographic that they're targeting and being very thoughtful about locations? So I think you do need to be, um, you need, need to be a little bit more prescriptive in, in building this out. Um, but I think it does really hinge once again on that, like what happens with the middle income consumer next year. Yeah. All right, up next, Mike Santoli. He'll join us with his midday word. We're back right after this. Senior Markets commentator Mike Santoli joining us with his midday word. I don't know. Was he hawkish? Was he dovish? I, I think it seems like was, the market doesn't really know what it, what he was yesterday. Right. Uh, and I think he was um, very reflective of where the Fed is right now, which is it's going to take advantage of whatever the market gives it on the tightening side. Um, and it's an inherently ambiguous moment, right? Because you don't really know if you have to do more. And I think that the market doesn't know what to do with it because also the Fed's not the story right now. And it hasn't been for a little while. Um, the Fed's only the story to the extent that they want to try and counter anything the market's already trying to do. So today, you know, the, the stock market, just as we get as concerned about 5% Treasury yields as you can, and the sensitivity to every move in Treasuries gets really extreme, um, you back off 5% and stocks are still for sale right now, mm -hmm. testing the low end of the range. Uh, it feels like you got a case of the Fridays again. Last Friday, we were starting to clench up ahead of mm -hmm. the unknown what might come. Um, you do see some of the generals getting sold, and I think that's interesting. NASDAQ 100 today is underperforming the average stock, and that maybe is sort of what happens toward the latter part of a pullback and also when you're facing those earnings uh, next week. Right. It should be, I think people hope, all about the big company earnings. Is that, is that enough to get us back to where the narrative once was? That these stocks are the ones to, to bank yeah. on, and having their success is good enough for the market to have overall success. But I mean, going into the reports, you know, Nvidia's down nine percent yeah. this week. Apple's down about three. Amazon's down three. Tesla's down fifteen. Yeah. I, I don't know if we ever were there where it was like, oh, all we got to worry about is five stocks and we'll be fine. But I do think that there's a question you might want to ask is, how negative do you want to be if yields are calming down? The S&P's at support. People have gotten a little bit nervous and we have those earnings coming mm, next mm -hmm. week. You know? So, I, again, that's one of those, uh, depending on your current and recent position, it's going to determine whether you feel like you're leaning too far one well, way that, or the other. That's what I was saying to you, Weiss, right? You, you want to be that negative going into potentially all of that. Yeah, but, but the way I see it is that the downside risk is, risk is much greater from those three companies, number one, number two. Like Netflix, who had a blowout number, it really hasn't informed the market action. Well, so, I mean, Netflix is so a $150 billion market cap Yeah, but I, but I think what, what you'll see is that you'll undoubtedly see a lift because they're weighted in the index appropriately well, now. for a lift, right? But I just don't believe it will be sustainable. I think it'll be a trade. I mean, I do think there is an issue with, and we'll see next week will be a little more of a sample, but stocks have not traded well off earnings. Just in aggregate, they haven't, um, even if they're beating. And that's been a pattern because investors just don't want to go out on that limb to say, we can extrapolate the strength from here. But let me say this, I'm big enough in meta. Microsoft's a big position, it's just not big enough. So if that sells off, because of earnings, I'm buying because you have to buy them when they sell off. The fundamental story is the most powerful going forward in AI, without exception. Meta? Microsoft. Oh, Microsoft. Yeah. 
All right. Well, we'll see. I'll 10% see you in, off the high, yeah. I'll see you in a little bit. Uh, a couple hours. That's Mike Santoli. Coming up, we'll get you ready for the biggest week of earnings season beyond the mega cap names. We'll tell you the key names that are on the committee's radar. Of course, we'll trade and we'll do it next. Oh, beyond the mega caps, there's the board. Nearly 150 S&P 500 companies reporting, 12 Dow components. Kevin Simpson, Verizon, Visa, UPS, Merck, Chevron are on the board. You already kind of touched on Chevron because when we talked about SLB. Give me something on Visa since we've been talking about financials. Well, I think Visa is going to blow it out of the park. They are a company that has practically no debt. They're not exposed to the consumer. They have um, just an incredible balance sheet. It's a fintech company. It's a, it's a financial company. And it's a stock that I would expect to do very, very well next week. Okay. You going to take on that? Yeah, I used to own Visa. I agree with everything you say about the company. But the stock really has not been a great stock for whatever reason. So... Um, you know, I mean, it's a permanent compounder, but not an exciting one. It's up 12% on the year. Yeah, I said it's Almost 13. Right. Mark's up 20. All right. He's, he's a hard guy to please. I mean, what, what can there's I say? A few, there's a few tech stocks that are carrying right. the market up. He just, they'll throw meta in your face. Um, Verizon. That's what he likes, meta-like gains. Okay? So if Verizon. You're gonna, if you're going to pick on me, you can pick on me for Verizon. I won't fight back. We've got to have exposure in the telecom space. It's like, you know, what are you going to do? Now, AT&T is surprised to the upside, so who knows? Maybe we get lucky with Verizon. I do think the dividend's safe. I think they're stopping and slowing down the CapEx on the 5G. They're laying some people off, so they're looking at the balance sheet. I think it's a stock I would not necessarily be buying in a weakness, but I wouldn't be a seller here. All right, you want to take on Merck, and then we'll get uh, Mr. Weiss's opinion since he likes profitable health care? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, the, the health care stocks have not been good either. I mean, it's, it's just languishing. But there is a, a p tremendous pipeline with Merck. The balance sheet is fantastic. The profits are always there. They just beat and beat and beat and beat. No one's interested in the share price or the stock. So again, there, I'm not sure if I'd be a buyer on weakness, but I would not be a seller. What about UPS? Well, I love it. I think the market's getting UPS so wrong. Ever since the last quarter, they've been selling off. They settled with the team, so they sold off. I don't know that the numbers will be great, but I would absolutely buy on any weakness with this company next week. Yeah, UPS, look, I've been surprised by the strength in UPS and FedEx, but it's somewhat of a duopoly, although you have DHL, that's the biggest 3PL in the world. So it'll be very interesting, but with consumer not slowing down with what we've seen in retail sales, there's no reason to think that they're going to disappoint. And they've got more price discipline in terms of what they charge their customers and who they do business with. So I think it should be okay. Shan, take us beyond the mega caps on the board. Um, which, which stocks, if, if any, jump out to you that you'll be watching more than some others? Yeah, I mean, we've got a number of large industrials next week, Scott, and I think that's another um, key point, you know, is this um, relative reacceleration in manufacturing and the potential for infrastructure spend next year coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act? Does that create, um, you know, Kevin obviously made some trades in this space, uh, you know, with CAT. Um, does that create some, you know, fundamental enthusiasm for the industrial sector? Or does it, is it just too late cycle to get excited about cyclicals? So looking at sort of some expectations for next year in the industrial space is, I think, an, an interesting point outside of mega cap tech next week. What about you, Josh? Look, I think this is going to be a tough market regardless, and I think what you want to focus on, the thing that worked all year, is quality. You take a look at every sector in the market, the, the stocks that are on top in terms of returns year to date have one major thing in common. They're the best companies in the group with the best balance sheets and the highest earnings quality. And I don't see why that's going to change in the next 10 weeks. So if you're out there on a day with the VIX at 19, 19 and a half, 20, and you want to add risk, add it the right way and focus on the companies that have the highest quality. I, I think that works in all 11 S&P sectors, quite frankly. Let me, let me just get you real quick, Josh, on, on a couple of mega cap notes that were, were out re related to earnings. I, I, we couldn't get to it because we had so much going on in the, in the A block. But the technical setup Wolf is talking about for, for mega caps, for example, Alphabet is going to outperform into Alphabet, the print. Yeah. That's you. Um, you know, Amazon, there's some positivity out there. RBC says the positioning sets up most favorably among the mega caps for Amazon. You want to take those? Yeah, Alphabet of of the Fangs is the closest to its uh, is the closest to its uh, all time high, which was set back in November of 2021, about 148.68, give or take. Uh, the stock is 
you know, 10 points away. And it's really done nothing. It's been biding its time. It's almost two full years. But if you look at the earnings growth, it's actually better than Apple. It's better than some of the stocks that have made new highs subsequent to then. So I think this is the, the, the one that I feel best about going into the numbers. JP Morgan points out that Amazon is their number one uh, internet pick going into this new earnings report. What Amazon has in its favor is that they have drastically cut back on costs and that's gonna start showing up in free cash flow in a way that might upside be an upside surprise to the street. So I'm long both those names. I agree with both of those ideas technically and fundamentally. I wanna be an Alphabet and Amazon more so than the other fangs going into next week. All right, we will take a quick break. Bitcoin having a breakout week of sorts. We'll get the committee's take next. Welcome back. Bitcoin back on the rise. Best week, Weiss, since June. You own Bitcoin. I, I do. And, and what's behind that is that, um, is that decision that the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals made, you know, beating down the SEC in terms of with Grayscale, uh, Grayscale's quest to launch an ETF. And today is the day that, that the Circuit Court of Appeals has until to modify their decision for not going to. The SEC already came out and said they're not going to appeal. So I don't believe in the use case for Bitcoin. I don't see any use case for it. And in 13 years, one has not emerged. But I do believe in supply demand driving a trade. So as you get these ETFs approved, as you get the massive marketing machines, machines from BlackRock, from Melody, there's just not enough. So I'll buy a little more. I missed it. I tried to buy some today, but I missed it. I will buy more. I think Bitcoin keeps going higher. Okay. We will take a quick break and we'll come back with Final Trades next. All right, three o'clock Eastern, closing bell. We wrap up the week, march it to the finish with Dan Greenhouse, Cameron Dawson, Delphi Scott Black is back with us. Value investor extraordinaire will give us some stock picks, I'm sure. Chris Harvey, too, has a new note out today from Wells. Uh, he's been talking about what stocks need to do uh, or what they can do between now and the end of the year relative to rates and earnings. So we'll catch up with him, too. Uh, Shan, final trade. We have consumer staples and not just because people are feeling uneasy about the Middle East. There's an opportunity for margin recapture in this sector next year as inflation comes down. Thank you, Josh Brown. Uh, Uber, they're a late reporter, not until November 7th, uh, but it'll be here soon, and I think it'll be a good report. Yeah, speaking of late reporters, don't forget next week, we don't get Apple yet for a little bit. We don't get NVIDIA yet yep. for a little bit. So, you know, we got to go in steps here before we get to the, the biggest one in, in the market and arguably the most important as it relates to AI to some. Uh, Kevin Simpson, what do you got? Well, we do get Microsoft, and that'll be yes, my final do. trade. It's off 6% since the last earnings report. They crushed it top and bottom line, double-digit growth for years. I like the stock. I'm staying short the ITB. I just don't see any good news for construction, either commercial or residential. All right, thank you. See you on Closing Bell. The exchange is now.